Hi, good morning. Thank you all for coming. I'm very excited to talk to you today. I'm going to be giving you a talk called A Picture Worth a Thousand, a Picture Worth a Thousand Programs. And it's going to be about making pictures, specifically about making pictures of programs, and hopefully making pictures worth a thousand programs. So to quickly introduce myself, although the MCs did a great job, I'm Maggie. I'm primarily a designer, but I also do art direction, illustration, and I build things on the web with JavaScript. I currently lead design at a company called Hash. But before Hash, I worked at Egghead for five years, which is a JavaScript education platform. While there, I spent a lot of time creating visual representations of programs. I made a lot of cover illustrations like these ones for the courses we taught, which involved coming up, coming up with lots of visual metaphors for abstract programming concepts like Redux, TypeScript, MopX. I made illustrations and diagrams to explain topics like how JavaScript prototype inheritance works or what happens when you flatten an array. Here's another on what APIs are and how they work, all told through small robotic waiters. I also worked on a project called Just JavaScript, which I co-created with Dan Abramov. It's a JavaScript course that teaches the core mental models of the language through visual diagrams and animations. We developed a visual language where every piece of syntax correlates to a specific visual shape, and we use the system to explain concepts like assigning properties or object mutation. The goal of all these illustration projects I've worked on is to make complex technical topics relatable and easier to understand, which is going to be a theme you'll hear a lot about in this talk. In the process of going through transforming programming concepts into visuals hundreds of times, I've been forced to think a lot about the ways we represent and communicate complex programming ideas. And I've come to believe visual representations have a lot to offer us, more than we give them credit for. In this talk, I'm going to show you how visuals can make programming concepts less abstract, easier to learn, and more accessible to more people. I'm also going to show you why visuals are so special, and it turns out to be relatively simple. Visuals bring invisible abstract programming concepts down into the embodied world. The embodied world is where you and I live. Everyone watching this talk has a body, and you use it to interact with physical objects around you, to move through space, and to experience events over time. Everything you know about the world is mediated through your body. This fact is so fundamental that we sometimes completely forget it. And programming concepts are abstract ideas that do not live in the embodied world here with us. They're imaginary objects and functions that exist in liminal space that feels like it doesn't obey the same laws as physics as we do. And the only way we interact with it is through this disembodied experience of typing linear text into a code editor. This is precisely what makes programming so difficult. We're trying to reason about and work with things we cannot see or touch. When we are creatures who are evolutionarily adapted to function in a highly spatial physical world. And I'm going to argue that visuals are a huge part of bridging that gap between the embodied human world and then disembodied programming world. So we're going to explore this topic through three questions. We're first going to ask, what's wrong with text? We're then going to ask, what can visuals do that text can't? And finally, we're going to go on a brief history tour to find out, haven't we already tried this? To ruin the ending, yes, lots of people in the past have explored ways to make programming more visual. We're going to look at what's already been done and what opportunities to lie ahead. So first, what's wrong with text? This is an important question to ask because almost everything we do in program is, programming is expressed in text. This is how every app you've ever worked on looks, right? You arrange lines from left to left, right and top to bottom. Here's every documentation website you've ever read. Here's every blog post you've ever learned from. The balance of text to visuals in our industry is easily 98% text to 2% visuals. All of our current programming languages, tools, interfaces, and documentation are overwhelmingly text-centric. You sometimes get diagrams here or there, but it's really slim pickings. There are plenty of historical reasons for this. This is a computer circa 1970. You'll notice the lack of screen. Oh, you can't see that. Oh, I don't know why you can't see that. Okay, imagine a computer without a screen. Uh, up until the 1990s, the only way to program was to write in linear text without a graphic in graphical interface. This meant we established text as the primary me medium of programming very early on. <laughs> there are plenty of logical reasons for why text is so great. Written words and syntax are ideal mediums for expressing ab abstract logic. They're quick to create, they're easy, and they're flexible to move around between applications with copy and paste. You can pack a dense amount of information into a very small space, and you can be very specific about what you mean, which is obviously important when we're talking to computers who have no sense of nuance. So text has been working great for us. But some of text's greatest weak strengths are also its greatest weaknesses. The abstract nature of text is what removes it from our embodied experience in space and time. When we write code, we're writing a set of hypothetical instructions to run on someone else's machine somewhere in the future in a time and place we'll never know. 
This level of abstraction removes the physical, spatial, and embodied qualities that humans rely upon to understand the world around us. This can be good in some ways. When we write a function like fetch user data, we don't have to think about its size, shape, or color. It's just a simple function. But you, know what's, but you already know what this function is and how it works and where it's located, so this level of brevity is great. But if someone's new to programming or even just new to your code base, they have no pre-existing mental model of how this might work. One of the easiest and most effective ways to make it comprehensible to them is to explain it in familiar terms by using physical qualities they already understand, like size, shape, color, and spatial relationships which might give us something like this for our fetch user data function. The visual doesn't have to be crazy complex or beautiful. Boxes and arrows work great. And we're certainly allowed to use text labels to make imagery clear. Visuals just let us use our pre-existing embodied knowledge to show how programs work in a way that text can't. So I've started to hint at the question we're going to look at in part two, which is what can visuals offer us that we can't get from linear text? I think visuals reveal three things, three aspects of programming that we're unable to see in text. They reveal fundamental metaphors embedded in our programming languages. They reveal spatial mappings that we use to reason about how our programs are structured and how data moves through them. And they reveal how our programs and data behave over time. These things are all implicit in the programs we write, but they're not explicitly shown in the medium of linear text. So let's start with metaphors. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, let's establish that metaphors are thinking tools that allow us to understand one thing in terms of another. So we have this thing we understand, thing A, and a thing we don't understand, thing B. And we map the qualities of thing A onto thing B. So if I say corruption is a disease, you map what you know about diseases onto corruption. You learn that corruption spreads easily, it's difficult to overcome, and it can threaten the health of a society. Now, when I talk about metaphor in the context of programming, I don't mean the fanciful creative metaphors you find in poetry and parables, like taking the road less traveled or wandering lonely as a cloud. Those are called figurative or poetic metaphors, and they're the sort we're warned not to use in technical tutorials because elaborate, poorly chosen ones can be more confusing than helpful. I'm talking about a much more fundamental type of metaphor that lies at the heart of all abstract thinking, and that's called cognitive metaphor, since they enable cognition on a much deeper level. These cognitive metaphors are based in our embodied experiences of the world. They ha we have all these non-physical things we need to communicate to each other, like emotions and thoughts and ideas and programming concepts. And in order to understand them and talk about them, we use our experience of the physical world around us as a metaphor. If you look at the way we talk about abstract things, this becomes obvious. We talk about ideas in terms of light when we say that's a bright idea or that really illuminates the problem. We talk about emotions like they're objects. We say he hid his jealousy or she doesn't handle her anger very well. We can also use force and motion metaphors to describe experiences, like I found your talk moving, it really touched me. Or I could talk about programming ideas in terms of temperature, like we have hot reloading in React, or how the JavaScript landscape is heating up. This isn't a theory I've come up with on my own. These principles come from the field of cognitive metaphor and embodied cognition. They were first developed in the 1980s by researchers like George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, and it's become a major area of research in cognitive science. These books, Metaphors We Live By and Philosophy in the Flesh, are two of the major texts if you're curious to learn more about it. Just like every other abstract topic that we can't see or touch, programming relies heavily on these physical embodied metaphors. And we have to because programming is a game of abstractions. When we run a JavaScript file, what we're really doing is telling a microchip to flip a bunch of logic gates, gates using tiny electrical pulses. Programming tiny log logic gates is very tedious and difficult for humans. So we've developed an elaborate stack of metaphors that make it faster and easier for us. Some people might call these abstractions. We simplify our binary code into machine code, which is simplified into higher level languages like JavaScript, which we simplify with GUIs. And at every step of this process, we're trying to make the abstract ab machine world resemble our tangible human world. The closer we move towards in in intuitive embodied knowledge in the upper right-hand side of the scale, the easier it becomes for us to understand what's happening in the system. Components are a great example of embodied metaphors in action. Most JavaScript frameworks have the concept of components in some way. They're essentially containers that hold bits of logic and groups of UI elements for us. Now, the CPU that's eventually going to render this card component on the screen knows nothing about containers. It only knows machine code and how to make the right pixels light up. The container is a metaphor that we humans need in order to manage and organize the code. The only reason you know what a container is is because as a child, you dumped sand into a bucket and poured it out again. This interaction with the physical world of learning through embodied experience 
taught you that containers hold things, that they have insides and outsides, that they have boundaries. All of these concepts are essential and necessary for you to understand how components work. If we take another one, in most JavaScript projects, we have a structure of components that's like a hierarchical tree where everything is connected back to a single root component. You know what a tree is from seeing thousands of trees. You get that they have many branches that spread out from a single root. And you, from that understanding, that allows you to work with component trees in JavaScript. Again, we're borrowing from the human world to interact with machines in a way that is easy and natural for us. And you can probably see where I'm going with this. Since your understanding of the programming world is based in your pre-existing knowledge of the physical world, it would be helpful if we could make that explicit in the way we represent and explain programming. And visual mediums allow us to do this. If we move on to our next visual quality, space, You'll see that humans with bodies, we inherently understand a large array of spatial concepts like up, down, left, right, in, out, big, small. And just like we use metaphors based in physical objects to understand our programs, we also use this knowledge of spa physical space to talk about the structure and behavior of programs. If you think about the way we talk about the internet, there are very clear physical directions to it. We upload data to the cloud and download files to our desktops. We look through a browser window. We browse web pages moving from left to right. So visited, pages we visited in the past are on the left and pages we're going to in the future are on the right. This extends to the way we talk about development architecture. Our apps have directionality because they have front ends and back ends and frameworks that sit somewhere in the middle. In frameworks like React, we have the concept of down, downwards data flow. We use our understanding of vertical direction to think about how data moves. So React has a hierarchical order of components, right parent components, parent components pass their data down to child components, which means we also have gravity in JavaScript land. All of these examples use spatial principles from the embodied world to talk about and understand how the program works. Our final element is change over time. So when we're working in a linear text editor, time is essentially invisible. When we look at a static representation that describes a whole array of future events that may or may not happen, depending on what button a user clicks or whether a data request resolves. We're forced to use our imaginations to predict what's going to happen in all these potential futures, rather than being able to see it in some form. Our current technique for doing this is to console log data along the way, which feels like trying to get a program to send signals up to the surface of a dark ocean where everything is being executed out of sight. We can't see anything happening down there, and we just have to keep asking for clues about how the data is changing. This doesn't feel like the best developer experience. This is again where visuals might come in handy because they allow us to see multiple points in time within a single frame. They allow us to compare things side by side in ways that we can't with linear text. They essentially allow us to play spot the difference. One of my favorite examples of a visualization, visualization that does this well is by Philip Roberts who gave it at a JSConf talk in 2014 called What the Heck is the Event Loop? This is one of the most watched JSConf videos of all time with 2.3 million views which certainly tells you something about how impactful a simple visualization can be. The reason this is so popular is Roberts made event loops, a process that is otherwise entirely invisible to us, visible by animating a few boxes in a sequence. So this is a very short recording of loop, which is the demo that Roberts gave at the talk. Good, it's playing. Uh, it shows a reasonably simple animation of how JavaScript executes a timeout function using web APIs and the callback queue. You can see the timeout request being sent to the web API, the timer starting, and then once it finishes, the request is being put onto the callback queue, which pops it back onto the call stack. There's nothing exceptionally fancy about this visual demo, but it's super effective. First, because it's showing us parts of the JavaScript ecosystem that are mostly invisible to us, like web APIs and the callback queue. And second, because it's showing us change over time. It's making visible the steps that happen behind the scenes when we run a chunk of JavaScript. If you want to go play with this yourself, I highly recommend it. There's a demo online at latentflip.com slash loop. Uh, and if you don't understand the callback queue, it will definitely explain it to you. So finally, part three, haven't we already tried this? Obviously, I am not the first person to realize that visual mediums enable us to understand and reason in ways that are worth exploring and programming. The primary way people have tried to incorporate visuals into programming in the past is by sticking graphical user interfaces onto IDEs. All these efforts fall under the umbrella of what gets called visual programming. There have been many, many attempts at this with varying degrees of success. I'm going to quickly whip through a few examples so you get a sense of what's been tried. This is Grail from 1968, which was one of the very first visual programming languages. This gave us text in boxes for the first time. This is Pygmalion from 1975 that built on that box narrow model. 
This is LabVIEW, which came out in 1986 and used for systems engineering. We got a lot more intense about the boxes at this stage. Here's a more modern example. This is Blueprint in Unreal Engine, which is used for 3D game development. And this is Origami Studio, which is a prototyping tool built by Facebook quite recently. You'll notice the node and wire design pro pattern is quite popular in a lot of these. So there's a lot of really promising stuff in these examples, but visual programming is still relatively niche. We've also discovered a bunch of wicked design challenges that, with it that are really hard to solve. These systems don't scale well to large complex projects. They sometimes use ambiguous symbols and unfamiliar interface patterns. They try to turn everything into a box, which takes up way too much screen space. And it can lead to literal spaghetti code, like this Figma prototype gone awry. These issues have led to a lot of skepticism over the feasibility of visual programming. Being an advocate for it often feels like being Gretchen in Mean Girls. Visual programming isn't dead, though. Funnily enough, the new no and low code movement looks suspiciously like visual programming under a new name. Many of the interface patterns that visual programming helped develop, like node and wire or direct manipulation, are visible in tools like Integromat, Zapier, or Webflow. Rather than trying to build Turing complete visual languages able to reach industrial scales, we've tactically moved on to developing visual interfaces for specific use cases in programming with sensible constraints. Here's an example of doing this well. Some of you might have used Stately AI. It's a relatively new visual interface for building state machines in JavaScript, where the visuals and the code are connected, so you change one and the other updates. It's a perfect example of visual programming for a specific scoped context. It's not trying to visualize your ent entire code base. It's just helping you visualize states and the transitions between them. It also integrates with VS Code, so it's backwards compatible. You won't have to buy into brand some brand new language or proprietary app to use this. This is exactly the kind of thing we need more of. So I'm a huge fan of visual programming, obviously, and I'm here to try to find ways to add more visual affordances into our current developer tools. There are tons of smart, impressive people working on the problem, but in many ways, it's taking the hard route. Building a true visual programming medium will require overcoming a ton of design, cultural, and engineering challenges. And frankly, it's probably going to take a while. And I think there are easier ways to advance this effort in the short term. We can simply sprinkle some visuals into our existing textual world, which means adding more diagrams and illustrations into blog posts, documentation, and learning materials. And if we're feeling brave, building plugins for our editors and developer tools that visualize small scoped elements of our programs. This is essentially the low tech paper prototype version of building a fully fledged visual programming interface. So to wrap this up, here's the thing I want you to take away from this talk. We need more visuals that reveal metaphors, spatial meaning, change over time to make programming easier for everyone. It will make it easier for you since you've, you're an embodied human who needs to learn complex abstract programming ideas in order to do your job well. It makes it easier for all the people who don't currently know how to program but are trying to learn. And it makes it easier for people who aren't developers but who need to understand what we do, like product managers and designers who can't read all the jargon in our text documentation. So what can you, a humble but skilled JavaScript developer, do to advance that goal? First, explore the history of visual programming and some of the past attempts in that field. There's a lot of previous art to learn from. If you are a current or future creator of tools for other developers, you should consider ways to build visual affordances into your libraries, plugins, apps, or frameworks. And finally, you should use and advocate for visual explanations in documentation and tutorials. That might mean making them for your own blog posts or collaborating with designers if you work on larger projects with documentation. We can set the bar low for now and try to budge the fake statistic up to like 10%. That was a lot of information packed into one talk. This was definitely a taster session to get you intrigued rather than a complete meal. So I've put together a list of some things you can Google to learn more. These will also be up uh, on my website at maggieappleton.com slash programming pictures where I have the transcript for this talk and all the slides. Um, George Lackoff and Mark Johnson have written lots of great stuff, Barbara Traversky, Brett Victor is a, a fantastic program. You should watch all his videos if you haven't. Uh, and there's great uh, resources on the futureofcoding.org. So thank you very much for listening. If you want to learn more about visual programming and metaphors in general, I have a lot written up on my website. And you can tweet me at, at Matt Littons on Twitter.